I always thought it was ridiculous that they made us wear our helmets, like, all the time. Like, anytime you're driving a military vehicle, you're supposed to have the helmet on. But the helmet is not good at stopping you from getting a fucking concussion. If you were riding in a vehicle, and you're wearing that stupid Kevlar helmet, and you got thrown through the windshield of the vehicle, <laughs> it's not gonna stop you from getting killed. I, I think they just want to instill muscle memory in you, so whenever you get into a Humvee, you put your helmet on, as you normally would if you were in an active war zone. I guess, yeah, that does kind of make sense. Same reason you're not allowed to walk around with hands in your pockets. What? How is that the same reason? Because you wouldn't have your hands in your pockets in a combat scenario, so why would you do it now? Yeah, I would. You would worm up your hands in your pockets? Yes. That is the most grave sin. <laughs> Apparently. The most grave sins in the military are using things for what they were intended to be used for. Pockets? Don't put your hands in them. Hood? Why, you're not allowed to use that. That's evil. Carrying handle? I'll chop off your hands. <laughs> yeah, I had to work on top of an MRAP at one point, And they were like, oh, if you're working on top of the MRAP, you have to have a helmet on in case you fall off. I'm not a fan of the MRAP. I prefer M country. Oh, I, I got it now. I got it now. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. That took a second. That was a slow burn. <laughs> the slow burn. You had to decipher this stupid joke. But yeah, they were like, you have to wear this helmet anytime you're on top of the MRAP in case you fall off so you don't crack your head open. I'm like, it's, it, it's a Kevlar helmet. If I fall off the vehicle and land on my head, I'm still going to split my fucking head open. It's not like it's a motorcycle helmet. There's not styrofoam padding on the inside of it. It's just stupid rules for stupid people. You're talking about putting a helmet on top of a grenade. There were a bunch of British soldiers that were in Afghanistan, I believe. One of them stepped on a booby trap and realized that it was a fragmentation grenade. And he was the radio operator, so he had this big bulky backpack with, uh, with the radio in it. So he was like, well, I'm probably going to die, so I might as well just try to save as many other people as I can. <laughs> so he jumped on top of the fragmentation grenade with his backpack. Okay. The fragmentation grenade went off and launched him about 10 feet forwards. <laughs> And when the rest of his team got to him, they discovered that aside from having a ruptured eardrum, he was completely fine. Dang. Because the backpack, the radio, and his body armor had completely taken the blast of the grenade. Wow. So he was fine. <laughs> and they were like, we got to medevac you right now. And he went, no, 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 hang on, hang on a second. I know I'm slightly concussed, but this is a great idea. Because the bad guys heard that go off and they'll be coming to investigate, let's just set up an ambush and wipe them out when they get here. <laughs> And they did. And, okay. <laughs> I don't know what the exact numbers were, but they killed a whole, whole lot of people. Well, that's a fun story. Yeah, but he's like one of the only people that has jumped on a grenade to save his teammates and didn't die. The, his backpack is like at the War History Museum in, uh, in the UK somewhere. Nice. It's just a backpack that's been completely blasted apart. Do it again, do it again, do it again! I'm, I'm sure he probably didn't want to do it again, but um, <laughs> I, would be, I would be hella stoked to be alive if I had done that. Yes. The patent quote of, uh, in war, you don't want to die for your country, you want to make the other unfortunate bastard die for his. Mm-hmm. I've heard that quote, yep. Or the VA's motto, giving you a second chance to die for your country. Are these your favorite military quotes? No, those aren't my favorite ones. What is your favorite military quote? Ooh. One of my favorite quotes is from the Battle of Messine. It was an incredibly bloody battle in World War I in France. The British had been engaging in this long campaign of digging mines all the way to the German lines and burying literal tons of explosives under the German lines. Mm hmm And the day before they set all of these explosives off, the British general said to his troops... Gentlemen, tomorrow we may not win the battle, but we'll definitely change the geography. <laughs> nice. And it resulted in the biggest combat detonation of explosives until World War II. Did they indeed change the geography? Yeah, they did. They created a lake in France that people <laughs> think is still haunted. <laughs> because tens of thousands of, of soldiers died. Sacre bleu, there's a spirit coming out of the ocean. I forget who said it specifically, but the quote of, Sir, they have us surrounded. That simplifies the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like a chesty puller quote. Oh, yep, chesty puller. One of the Marines they taught us about. Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly, chesty puller and Smedley Butler were the only two people to have two medals of honor, if my memory serves. One of my other favorite quotes is from Alvin York, who was a World War I American soldier uh, who captured, I think, 180 prisoners of war. 
Wow. Effectively by himself. <laughs> All right. Him and like several other people escorted the prisoners of war back to American lines. And when he got back, a general said, well, York, I hear that you've captured the entire German army. And he said, no, sir, I only got 180. <laughs> <laughs> Just the fucking balls on that man. <laughs> Sorry, I got my Marines confused. Chesty Puller did not get the Medal of Honor twice. That was Smedley Butler and Dan Daly. Oh, he was the one that said, do you want to live forever? Well, that quote is legendary, too. I think my favorite Marine might be Smedley Butler, who, once he got out, wrote the book War is a Racket, and that denounced the military-industrial complex. I remember hearing about him. Supposedly, there was, at one point in history, a bunch of large business owners. They were, like, planning a coup to overthrow the U.S. government, and they tried to convince Smedley Butler Mm -hmm. to basically be on their side, and he was like, uh, no, go fuck yourselves. Something to that effect, yeah. Yeah. You're probably familiar with the quote he said, which is my favorite quote. I spent 33 years and four months in active military service. And during that period, I spent most of my time as a high-class muscle man for big business. I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. I helped make Mexico, and especially Tampioco, safe for American oil interests. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National City Bank boys to collect revenues in. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. I helped purify Nicaragua for the international banking house of Brown Brothers in 1902 to 1912. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for the American sugar interests in 1916. I helped make Honduras right for the American fruit companies in 1903. In China, I helped see to it that standard oil went on its way unmolested. Looking back on it, I might have given Al Capone a few hints. The best he could do was operate his racket in three districts. I operated on three continents. I had never heard that one, but holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think they taught us that in boot camp. They just taught us, Dan Daly and Spadley Butler, you have to memorize these two people because they got Medal of Honor twice. They're heroes. So afterwards, I did a bit of research and found that quote. Damn. <laughs> yeah, I kind of wonder why they don't teach you about that part in basic training. <laughs> kind of flies in the face of the, Hoorah, we're Marines, we're the best! Yeah. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes of all time is not from anybody in the military, or even related to the military. It's from an animator. Okay. It's from Hayao Miyazaki. Mm-hmm. Very popular mm-hmm. one. Yes. Try to see the good in that which is evil, and the evil in that which is good. Pledge yourself to neither side but the balance that exists between the two. And I really like that one. Try to see the good in the world. Yeah. Try to see the good in the world and also when someone thinks they're doing something good, also try to see what is potentially bad about that. Related to that, never attribute to malice but you can attribute to stupidity. Yes, indeed. In my 20s... I was going to school Mm full-time while working full-time while doing Marine Corps on the weekends and sometimes the two or three weeks in the summer. That doesn't sound like a great time. It's just what I did. I would work third shift, and then I'd get out at 7 a.m., go to class, be there by 8, and I'd go to sleep at 3 p.m. Yay! And I'd sleep until 10 and wake (laughs) up... And do it again. Oh, no, that doesn't sound fun. Work, school, sleep, work, school, sleep, four days a week, maybe five, because I had some Friday classes. And you might be thinking, Mike, when did you get your homework done? Well, I did it on the weekends, if I didn't have Marine Corps that weekend. If I did have Marine Corps that weekend... I brought my homework with me and studied it while I was waiting. You nerd! There was so much downtime in the Marine Corps. You gotta put it (laughs) to something useful, right? Yeah. So I brought my chemistry textbook to the Marine Corps. Fun. But that's not nearly enough time to do all of my homework, right? No. Well, that's true. Which is why I also did my homework while I was at work. (laughs) So I would bring my flashcards and study them on the assembly line. I would try and recite things I had to memorize while I'm sweeping my bay. I studied my Spanish by talking to my coworkers. You just gotta find time here and there if you're gonna pack your schedule as stupidly tight. Yeah, don't pack your schedule that tight. (laughs) Well, let me tell you about the time I had this brilliant idea. You see, 
I wanted to get all of my classes in one day, so I wouldn't have to do so much time commuting. Mm-hmm. So I filled up my Saturdays with classes. 14 hours a day? <laughs> oh, God! What is wrong with you? But that was the only day I had to go to college that semester. Oh, my God. So I'd go to college all day Saturday, and then I'd have the entire week to do all my homework. My God, man. You're a madman. Yeah. Blame it on the Marine Corps for making me so diligent. You do, you do work a lot. Mm-hmm. And it paid off in the end. I, I partially paid off my way through college by working full-time yeah. for years. And after spending so much of my life doing Marine Corps slash school slash work constantly, I may have had a small mental breakdown. It didn't seem like a mental breakdown at the time, but... What do you call it when you sell everything you own, buy a truck, and drive around the country living out of your truck? Uh, call it van life. Van life. <laughs> <laughs> you call it the Jack Kerouac experience. I tell people, I'm going to drive to Nevada and live out of my truck. And they'd say, what's in Nevada? And I'd say, I don't know. Fuck you. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm going to find out when I get there. <laughs> Sand, I think. <laughs> I didn't even make it to Nevada at first. I got stuck in Utah for quite some time, s staying at the Zion National Park and checking out these beautiful gorges, and I thought, I don't want to go to Nevada. <laughs> Utah was nice enough. I want to go home. I'm bored. I want to go back to work. <laughs> no. You see, the thing is, when you don't take a vacation for 20 years, it's not healthy. You got to take vacation. Oy. So... I don't have any interesting stories because I didn't do anything. I, I went to college. Did I go to any interesting parties? No. Did I join any social clubs? Who has time for that? <laughs> we need to get you a hobby. Video editing is my hobby now. Get you like a fucking RC car or something. <laughs> That's your hobby. <laughs> I have too many hobbies. I have way too many hobbies.